Okay, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Guys can hear me, right? Sorry for those of you who are in YouTube land. I hear that we've got a buzz. I don't know if there's a buzz coming through right now. Hopefully there isn't. The wonders of technology. It's good to be on YouTube, I think. Sometimes I wonder. It's good that YouTube gives us an opportunity to spread the word of the Lord. So I'm thankful for that. Thankful, same thing, Facebook, all, all the social media. If we can use it in the right way, I'm all for it. But man, oh man, is it not hard to use it in the wrong way? Right? I should say, is it not easy but to use it in the wrong way? It's just very easy. So, all right, I'm getting off, off kilt here. Philippians 2, we're going to cover verses 5 through 11 tonight. Let's go ahead, read, and then we'll just start breaking the verses down. We've already prayed. So let's, um, starting in verse, I'll just read from 1. We'll come from 1 down to 11, okay? If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. See, not self-esteem, but others' esteem. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, verse 6, who being in the form of God, Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those are some good verses there, right? I'm, you want to memorize some verses, verses nine and, or, uh, 10 and 11 of chapter 2. Those are some good verses to memorize and I like to preach those verses when I'm out on the streets. Um, just to let people know, you know, everyone thinks that, uh, you know, just as long as you have some sort of generic belief in a God out there. No, no, no. Uh, you got to know his name. And it's a name that's above every name. Okay, so now verses 5 and 6. Let's start uh, again with just a re little reminder before we move into some doctrinal matters. It says, let this mind be in you, right? See that, verse 5? What mind? Go back to verse 3, lowliness, a lowly mind. Skip ahead to verses 6 and 7. What kind of a mind? A humble mind. Lowly, humble. Go to 1 Corinthians 2. Keep your place here. And I want to remind you of something. Because it says, let this mind, this Christ-like mind, let it be in you. All right? Now watch. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 through 16. Verse 14, I, I reference this a lot. But the natural man, what's the natural man? The unsaved, the, the flesh. Right? Your flesh isn't saved yet. You understand that, right? Okay. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. He must be born again. You had a born again spirit, right? Anyone here saved, born again? Okay, well then ye are spiritual. Which, by the way, means you are to judge all things. Just throwing that out there. Yet, he himself is judged of no man. Now, they may judge you, but the Lord's saying that doesn't count. I don't care what they say about you. Amen? Verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? That's a good question. 
that he may instruct them. Who is gonna who's gonna know God's mind so much that he may sit down? Now, God, listen, let's have a little chat. Let's go one on one. Let's talk. I want to explain some things to you, God. But we have the mind of Christ. Isn't that interesting? Because he says, let this mind be in you. Well, anyone saved here, well, then you're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Well, in what way? I'm going to attest in this way. You have the ability to know everything that Christ wanted you to know. That was in his mind that he shared with you. You don't have to remain in the dark, right? So you're no longer a natural man. Um, if you were then all you could think of would be not lowliness and humility, but haughtiness and pride. That's what we were just, what we were just talking about, what we were praying about, how that um, when the bad happens, man blames God. When the good happens, he boosts himself or other men. That's because they're natural. They don't know how to think properly. But... If you're in Christ, see, that's what it says, in Christ, then you're supernatural. You're spiritual. And you have the mind of Christ. you got to just let it be in you. You have it. He didn't say you always employ it. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago when we did this study. This lesson on humility and loneliness of mind and esteeming others before yourself, I said it was the cure for all sin. Not necessarily all iniquities. I mean, we have sometimes some, you know, some thoughts um, that are just vain or wicked, but they're not... How do I want to say it? They don't affect anyone else. You know what I mean? You know what your thought life is like. Um, but as far as hurting each other goes, as you're to, from, from, every, from strife within the body of Christ to uh, an argumentative spirit to someone that's always got to be right, someone who's critical all the time, these, these, these things that cause these outward transgressions, substance abuses, all that stuff that translates into the other realm, because all that stuff affects other people. Any sin that you do that affects other people can be fixed right here, this way, by esteeming others higher than yourself. It's the cure for everything. How did Christ get away with not sinning? He was 100% man. He wasn't 50% man and 50% God. He was 100% God and 100% man. He was tempted, but he didn't sin. Why? He knew he came for a reason and it wasn't for him. And if we can, as the body of Christ, if, if we can... Uh, get to that place of letting that mind be in us, there wouldn't be a selfish bone in the body of Christ. There'd never be a fight. You'd never have a reason to. Because the moment you were wronged, you'd be okay with being wronged. And you know what? You wouldn't be wronged because the person who was wronging you, if they had the same mind, would never wrong you. See how it works? We just cure it all. Well, that's not going to happen. Well, no, it's probably not going to happen on this side of eternity. But do I throw in the towel because I don't, you know? No, you strive for the mastery. All right, well, let's, let's move on. That, that was all covered uh, a couple weeks ago. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Okay, verse 6. So let's run a few verses now. Get Hebrews chapter 1. What does that verse say? Come on, what's the gist of that verse? Jesus is God. Okay? 
that Jesus is God and he didn't have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's funny that, what, that it even words it that way. Isn't that funny? You know why? Because the Lord knows the heart of man, and he knows man does have a problem with it. And just saying, just by the way, I don't have a problem with it. Me, God. <laughs> you know? Hebrews 1, verses uh, 1 through 4. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Glory, hallelujah. He's getting it all. And we're his bride, so by default, you know what I mean? By whom also he made the worlds, who being, see, see the phrase? The brightness of his glory, comma, and the express image of his person. Do you see why the Lord expressly tells you not to set up images? Because there is an express image of God and it's Jesus and no one else. And anything you carve with your little wicked hands is not going to be the brightness of God's glory like Jesus Christ is. So don't even try. Just look to Jesus and he'll give you the express image of who the Father is. Upholding all things by the word of his power. When he made himself, uh, made himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of uh, the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So, and, and by the way, that verse 4 can be confusing to some. Some people think, well, that means, see, Jesus was made. So he's a created being. The cultists teach that. Did you not just see before that says the express image of the person of God? Yes. Okay. Well, then get the context. It's, it's an expression of saying, it's not saying that he's created. It's saying that who he is is so much better than what the angels are. And yet you're all drooling over the angels. Oh. See, so I mean, it's... People see in the Bible what they want to see. But if you get the context, it just told you he's God. And if he's God, then he can't be, the cre he can't be created. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at this verse. Just give you one more. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And there's so many verses on the deity of Christ. Um, in whom, I'm just going with what Philippians says about the... Um, the form of God, express image, that type of thing. So 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In whom the God of this world, that's Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, comma, who is the image of God, comma, <laughs> should shine unto them. Now, couldn't that have been taken right out of there? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. But the Holy Ghost just decided, oh, wait a minute, you know what, I know how you guys think. By the way, he's God. Well, that's just Paul's writing, and Paul was a whack job. Okay, well then let's give you Isaiah the prophet. Go to Isaiah chapter 9. If, if that crazy Paul or that New Testament that you can't trust is no good, how about Isaiah the prophet? I love this stuff. This, this is good. Isaiah 9, 6. We know this verse. For unto us a child is born. Who's that? Why, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the baby in the manger. Unto us a son is given. That's little Jesus. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Uh, well, we don't know if we like that. And his name shall be called, capital W, Wonderful. Yeah. Counselor. No, we don't like his counsel. Stop talking, Jesus. We don't like that at all. Uh oh, now we got trouble. The mighty God. So that's that's Jesus, right? That's the little child in the manger, right? That's well. That little child born, that son given, he's called the mighty God. Next one, the everlasting Father. I and the Father are one. Prince of Peace. Just throw that out there too, because if you want some peace, you need to get some Jesus. Now, 
of all, most of the cultists fall, all of the cultists fall into this category of not believing that Jesus Christ is God the Father and God the Father is Jesus Christ. And I would include the Roman Catholic Church. Because they believe, they say, well, he's the Son of God. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Like Gabriel's the son of Seth? That's what they mean. But that's not what the scripture means. It means he's God. You look at him, you see God. When you look at the Father, you see Jesus. That's, that's what the scripture means. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses in particular, I looked up what uh, Isaiah 9.6 said in the New World Translation because I was curious. You know, what it would, I mean, they teach. I mean, they're very strict about this. Jesus is, he's a created being. He's not, you know, there's Jehovah and then there's Jesus, you know. Well, it says, for there has been a child born to us, there has been a son given to us, and the princely rule will come to be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. They put those two together instead of putting the comma. Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Well, I thought, well, how did they get around that? And then I noticed they had a cross-reference. Their cross-reference, go to John 1.18. This, this was their cross-reference. See, what they did was they explained it away with another verse that they corrupted. John 1.18, if you have a Bible, says this, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Okay? Now, as you're looking at that, let me read for you the New World Translation. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten little g God, who is in the bosom with the Father, is the one that hath explained him. So, what does all that mean? First of all, let me just say, the, the only begotten God? That's not what it says. Right. See, well, you'd say, well, is that making it more that he's deity? No. Little g goes back to the Garden of Eden. And it's Satan's doctrine to man, you shall be as gods. That's Jehovah Witness doctrine. You, you're no different than Jesus. You're going to be everything he was, not because of the new birth and what he can make you because of his sinless godhood, but because we're all eventually going to be little gods. It's amazing. There's, there is not a Greek manuscript out there, and I have a whole bunch of them, that takes the word uh, huias, that's how you pronounce it, huias, that's son, and replaces it with theos, or theos, which would be God. Where do, you, where do you get the only begotten theos? Where do you get the only begotten God? You're liars. You're just switching words, and you're just assuming that the ignorant Followers who can't know anything outside of a Watchtower magazine will never look at it themselves. They're not, they don't know Greek. The people, these leaders don't know Greek. I don't know Greek. Not the way God knows it. Certainly not the way the King James translators knew it. But I do know this. Huias is not theos. They're not the same words. One is Son, one is God. Again, this is satanic doctrine. That's what it does, and that's what all cultists do. You know, in some way, shape, or form, what they're going to try to do is they're not going to, they don't want to get you back to the garden. They want to get you back to Babel. Yeah. Finding God on your own, ascending to the heights, I will, I will. I will, I will, I will. Number for death. Uh, 
where am I going from here? Oh, okay, so here's what um, New World Translation says in, about Philippians, our verse in Philippians. <laughs> Unbelievable. Ready now. Uh, we're looking at verse... Uh, verses 5 and 6. Here's verses 5 and 6 in the New World Translation. Keep this mental attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who although he was existing in God's form, gave no consideration to a seizure. And in parentheses they say something that is to be seized or taken. So something, right? Listen to this now though who gave no consideration to a seizure, namely, that he should be equal to God. See that? See what they did? Just a few words twisted in the S shape of a serpent. And the, Bi the Bible says Jesus didn't think it robbery to be equal with God. The New World Translation says Jesus never thought to rob God by claiming equality. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Well, the, the, the New World Trans, the, all the translations are pretty much the same. That is your lazy ignorance speaking. So, you know, I mean, here's the thing, though. Got all these Jehovah's Witnesses, and, and I'll tell you this. By and large, they're far more zealous than we are. Now, listen, not in the workplace, because I've worked with them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, serious, they won't say a word. They won't say a word. But their zeal goes door knocking, and because, see, they think they've got to earn salvation. So I, I get that, why, why they do that. But I wish a little bit of that zeal a little bit of that fear of the Lord because they have fear that they're not going to get in. We don't have that because we're in. That's right. And because of that, we get very lackadaisical uh, in our witness, in our work, and so on and so forth. But, so I got to give them that, that they have, they have zeal, they have, they have fear. But um, I feel bad for so many of them because it's like the scripture says their leaders do cause them to err so here they are being told well here's what the Greek says and no you're being lied to well they don't know that and we've got the perfect translation here it is and all the other ones are wrong can we not relate to that right so how is one to know. How would a Jehovah's Witness, how could you relate to them on uh, any kind of level to say, um, you know, or, if, how do I want to articulate this? How are they to know that the book they've been told is 100% true? How could they ever possibly know that it isn't? I mean, besides someone coming along, what might be an indicator for them? If I could plead with them, I'd, I'd say, you know what? I'm probably not going to convince you that the King James Bible is the right book. But I want to ask you something. When you're reading your book, does it promote you to Godhood and Jesus downward? Because that's what all those verses do. Those verses we just ran. They give you Isaiah 9, 6 and then point you to John 1, 18 and say, well, he's just a created God like everyone else. And then let me show you the twist of Philippians and say that he would never think to rod God by being equal with him. Do you have the hope of becoming God? That's satanic. That is the garden. That's what he convinced Adam and Eve of. I would call you to just check out the book that you claim or that others claim for you is false or is true, your New World Translation, that you would just consider that the fruit thereof is teaching you Godhood and then lowering Jesus to that same level. 
Jesus, the, it's the name that is above every name, not below. So this is satanic doctrine. It's got the hiss of the serpent all over. Um, and that's what religious cults will do. Verses 7 and 8. It says, Being in the form of God took upon him the form of a servant. All right, so now notice the Bible difference. He, Jesus Christ, took upon himself the likeness of men and the form of a servant who was in the form of God. But he took upon him... So what, so what did he do? He lowered himself. What do cultists do? They lower him and raise up themselves. So just to my point, the complete opposite of what these verses are actually teaching. What is this whole chapter about? Humility of mind, not exaltation. I mean, come on. If you change the verse to say that Jesus never thought himself to be God, then how is that even a display of humility? If he's just a man saying, I would never think to rob God, that's the humility he showed? Shouldn't, I mean, isn't that the humility that we all go, okay, well, God's God and I'm man. I understand that. What's so great of an example? Ah, but if God lowers himself who should have the authority. Now we got an example. Because there's none of us that are at that level of God, and if he can do it, how much more? Right? All right, so let's move along here. But um, Jesus Christ humbled himself, and it says he became obedient unto death. What does that mean? Anyone? Oh, what does it mean? I, he became obedient unto death. All right, well, we've got to run a couple verses. Let's start with Acts 2. I know you know you're going to know all these verses. You just got to put them together. And it'll help define what became obedient unto death means. Acts 2, verses 22 through 24. Ye men of Israel... Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. See, verse 23, that's a fancy way of saying God knew it all along, but you did it. Amen? All right, verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Why? Why could death not hold Jesus? Because the wages of sin is death and Jesus knew no sin. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. Therefore death had no reign, rule, or control over him. It had no authority over the sinless Son of God. So according to Philippians, the Lord, what he did in, for us is he subjected himself. Not only did he come into the form of man and servant, but he subjected himself to death. He became obedient unto the law of death, which is in our members. That's something. Death should never have touched him. It had no authority over Jesus Christ. But he gave up the ghost. He subjected himself to death. God did that. God did that. Now that's humility. Again, you remove the deity of Jesus Christ and all of a sudden it's a little less humble. It's still humble, but it's, a, it's so much more when God subjects himself to death. To the wages of sin. The sinless one. But that's the mind. 
That's the attitude. That's the being of a servant. Because a servant puts others first. So, we see in verses 5 and 6 a humble mind, right? We see in verses 7 and 8 a servant's attitude. And what follows? Let's read the verses. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You've got a humble mind, you've got a servant's attitude, and you get a king's reward. Right. And I would also, seeing that we've had some fun discussing Jehovah's Witnesses tonight, at least I have. I would love to ask a Jehovah's Witness, if Jesus Christ isn't God, and therefore not worthy of worship, because he's not Jehovah, then why would it possibly be the glory of Jehovah that all people from all time bow every knee to Jesus Christ? Wouldn't that be robbery from God? It's not robbery if he's equal with God. Then it's the right thing to do. And God the Father is glorified because that is the express image of his person and his glory. When, you know, I mean, when, when Moses said, show me thy glory... And the image passed by and he could only look at the hind quarters. He saw the hind end of Jesus. Jesus is the glory of God. So I don't understand. How does it mean? Because all have sinned and come short of the... But Jesus never... So he's the express glory of God. He's the glory of God. And Christian, your inheritance because he's going to bring many sons unto glory. That's right. It's good. Amen. Now, every knee. Every knee. You know who's on that list? President Obama. Vice President Joe Biden. George Jeb Bush. Nancy Pelosi. John Boehner. Donald Trump. Every pope from Constantine to Francine. Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, Confucius, Stalin, Hitler, Roosevelt, Lincoln, Washington. Every atheist, every sodomite, every philosopher, every PhD. And their leader to boot, Satan himself. Every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen. And I'll tell you, I can't wait for that day. Because this will all be to the roaring, especially when it comes... you got to know. You know, we'll all be egging each other on when certain men come down that aisle. But when Satan comes down that aisle, before that throne, you got to know that it's going to be complete hush. Dead silence. And when he gets down on his knees and confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord like he demanded Jesus do, you got to know it's going to be to the roaring applause of the angelic host who didn't follow him, uh, uh, the, the, the cry of victory from the prophets who were martyred by his children, to the thunderous cheering of every street preacher, every godly pastor and teacher who upheld the scripture rather than tore it down. And probably to the tearfully joyful expression of every saint, whether great or small. And just as the martyrs were led to the slaughter without, without a thing they could do about it, every knee will bow, like it or not. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, like it or not. There won't be a thing you can do about it. That's when he's sovereign. You're gonna bow. I don't want to. 
you're gonna bow. Except here's the, here's the great thing is you can bow now and stand with him in that day. Or remain willfully stubborn now and be forced to bow later. Just before you're cast into outer darkness. To me, the choice is a simple one. But you know what it comes down to? You know what it comes down to? People don't believe the book. Because if they did, that's an easy decision. I bow right now and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, save me. Amen. Right? That's easy, if I believe it. Amen. The reason they don't do it is because they don't believe that. That's just silly. We'll see how silly it is. I'll be there. Amen. Standing with them. Amen. Cheering like I never cheered before. Amen? Amen. With or without a Super Bowl ring. <laughs> Father, thank you for your book. I thank you that you exalted the Lord Jesus Christ and that you will continue to exalt him. And I can't wait, Lord God, for the day that he is exalted before humanity right here on earth, sitting as King of Kings and Lord of Lords uh, in uh, Mount Zion and uh, all the kings of the earth, all the people of the earth flowing unto him for to hear from him, uh, for to learn from him, uh, just to kiss his hand. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry. Lord God, we can't wait for that day. We look forward to it. I pray that now, right here, right now, in our minds, in our hearts, we would begin to really consider Jesus Christ as our sovereign on that throne so that we might have the fear that we talked about that we don't have. We're really missing it because we, we know that we're saved. Um, but Lord, help us not to be slack in that. We, we want to hear the blast of a trumpet and not be ashamed, but to hear a blast of a trumpet and shout for joy just before we're raptured out of here. I just pray, Lord God, that we would take our lives seriously before you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.